these kind of teachers that don't live on your agenda. You cannot manipulate them. You cannot, you cannot seduce them. You cannot, you know, wheel and deal with them. These kind of teachers, very solid in who they are. And one of the reasons why I had, I had so much devotion to him and also Lama Dawa is because they had the capacity to be critical of their own culture, actually. You know, they weren't even playing the Tibetan game. You know, every culture, we have our game that we play to get ahead and, you know, to become well known or to have a certain position in society. And they didn't care less about this and always avoided this. You know, Kunsan Gorge Rinpoche had many opportunities to have an important position and he always turned it away from it and chose the life of, of a, you know, all yogi that you know, in his early days, wandered from place to place. In the later days, he lived in our house. The last nine years of his life, he lived in our house. And um, until he passed away and we cremated his body on the roof of our house. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today our guest is Kanjo Kunzang. Kanjo Kunzang has been a devoted student of the Dharma for most of her life. She is a holder of the Kanjo Tuktik path of the Dujum Terser and the Rigzin Sogjab Yoga practices of the Northern Treasures lineage. Until the passing of Lama Dal Rinpoche in 2017, she was his consort and companion and his main support for his teachings and activities in North America. Kanjo Kunzang now divides her time between teaching and traveling tours, serving as the executive director for Saraswati Bhawan, leading retreats and teachings at Purba Tinli Ling, overseeing the translations and publications of practice texts on Saraswati publications, heading the Purba Peace Mandala Project International, and offering teachings, guidance, and support to students worldwide. such a joy to be here with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. When did you first decide to delve into the Dharma and why did you choose to become a nun? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I think for those of us who are born in the West and have obvious karmic propensities, it's, it's sort of like we get triggered by something we see or something we read and it sparks something in the mind and sets us on our journey, you know? So yeah, so for me, it was like that, you know, encountering different things, like the first time I saw a Buddha statue when I was 14 years old, and it just woke up something in my mind, I didn't know what Buddha was. And then I just announced to my friends, I'm a Buddhist, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but there was something that spoke very deeply to me, that there was a recognition there. And, um, and I had had a series of experiences as a child, dreams, and uh, you could say visions that couldn't be answered. And so I naturally was a seeker, you know, always seeking and exploring. And, you know, I was born in 1960. So I grew up in sort of the heyday of when Eastern thought was coming to America. So there was all kinds of things that were going on. And exploring and there there used to be an organization called the liberal religious youth that was run by the unitarian church and they would hold these weekend conferences this is in the 70s and i used to go to them and i had some really profound experiences there that i didn't really understand and wanted to know more so you know i've always had this propensity to seek truth to want to understand and uh, innately knowing that there's more to this reality than meets the eye, you know, and so, so I, you know, that was a propensity I always had, but it was things like reading um, the, the autobiography of Yeshe Sogel written, translated by Keith Dowman, absolutely blew my mind, and 
that was the one of the main triggers that woke me up to I need to follow this because I, I know who this is. You know, I felt like I was reading a story of somebody that I knew, even though I didn't understand a lot of the terminology. And so you know, I had friends who had been, you know, students of Namkai Norbu, Trathang Tulku, and they kind of sent me books to read and like this. So I started reading and <laughs> And also where I grew up in the, the Hudson Valley of New York, you know, the Karmapa was coming to set up his center in Woodstock. This is in the 70s. And I knew about it, you know, when Chogim Trungpa was setting up his place in Vermont and they were starting to publish things. But I, you know, it didn't speak to me. It's interesting. I was exposed to this, but I found it to be kind of, I don't know, intellectual and psychological. And it didn't really speak to me because I was into nature spirits and going to Indian powwows and things like this. So it took a little while for me to really warm up to becoming a Buddhist and taking those refuge vows. You know, I was in my early 30s when I finally kind of said, okay, you know, I've got to do this. I was a little bit resistant because it just seemed very hierarchical and patriarchal and it you know it's interesting how we have these resistances and that certainly was part of how I was raised by my mother you know and sort of to have this kind of eh. but uh you know the karmic when the karmic seeds ripen they ripen in a really big way so so I finally after I encountered this book I uh went to a series of teachings by His Holiness Chetseng Rinpoche, who was doing a tour in the United States and just kind of jumped in, you know, how it is. Refuge, Bodhisattva vows, this empowerment, that empowerment. <laughs> like, I was so overwhelmed and, you know, my head was swimming, but I just kind of knew I have to do this, you know. And then it just, then I just sort of said, okay, what's next? I jumped in, what's next? And um, at that time, I was living in Vermont, in Burlington, Vermont, my beautiful Burlington, Vermont. I loved it there so much. And um, interestingly enough, after I took those refuge vows, my life started falling apart <laughs> in unexplainable ways. And, you know, it began with my son, who was 12 years old at the time, deciding to go live with his dad and my partner deciding to go back to his old girlfriend and my landlord wanting to sell my house <laughs> one by one, everything was leaving my life. And uh, I thought, I guess it's time for me to move, you know, all the things that hold, I hold so dear that is why I'm here. And also my career, you know, it was all changing. So I then made the decision to move to Maryland where the Drikun Kaigu Center was at that time. And so I did that. And after that became a nun, was ordained by Kinchen Kondra Gelsen and um, was some of the first students of His Eminence Garchun Rinpoche when he first came to the U.S. And, and uh, then he they bought land in Arizona and I was going to move to Arizona. And then Lamadala came <laughs> into my life. And again, the karmic winds blow as they say and that set me off on a completely different path and you know so here I am now 20 20 years later mm -hmm. and uh, so you know it's it's like that you know little things happen here and there and that sparks this and then you go pursue and that sparks that and you know for me I've always been a person that doesn't hesitate to just pack it up and move if I'm called to do that you know for some people you know, they, they're not so, I don't know, brave or, <laughs> yeah, I just like, okay, I have to do this. I get very strong, uh, intuitive guidance. And that kind of compels me to make decisions, even though they don't make sense at the time. So, but the decision to become a nun, that was uh, sparked by meeting great inspirations like Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo. I had spent a little bit of time with her when she came to the U.S. She was a tremendous source of inspiration. And, and of course, Gartrin Rinpoche meeting him. And so something in me woke up. And, you know, I was in my mid-30s at the time. And 
I just knew it was a calling. You know, I think those kinds of things have to be like a calling. There was never any pressure or any kind of, you know, just no, something in me is like, this is what I have to do. And so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing so many parts of that resonate on a personal level. And I also, yeah, yeah I really understand that feeling of everything falls apart and trusting the karmic seeds and, and following mm. that. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing the, the parts. I'm sure many people that will be listening can also resonate, especially because we're in a time where we like to kind of hold it all together when often the best thing yeah. is it falls all apart. So even and if it's difficult in the moment. so It is. And I've learned that that's the karmic process. And again, we go back to the fact that many of us here, Westerners had past lives. We wouldn't be interested in the Dharma if we didn't. Like, I just assume that anybody coming to teachings, there's some past life history here. There's something pushing people. Like, why would we choose this? It's, you know, and so something, there's a background there pushing you. And so we have to assume that we have latent karmas and that those seeds are going to ripen sometimes very <laughs> abruptly when sometimes when they ripen you know be ready for earthquakes for, you know and then your whole life as you knew it at the time when i had this experience in vermont i had this beautiful life and i then i realized this is a lie I, i'm living a lie because it's all based on a false premise of me i'm not who i think i am and this whole life that i've created is based on this fundamental lie. And that's actually, for me, it was terrifying. It was not a beautiful, exalted experience. It was terrifying. I cried for days. I had to cancel all my clients. And it was, you're left with then, well, who am I? <laughs> you know, And then off you go on your journey. <laughs> but it's not an easy experience. Yeah, it can be life-changing where things that were important to you can just fall away. Or you see that this is not what I need to do. And I, you know, I sometimes see sometimes couples that have been together and, and one of them has this experience and they realize I can't do this anymore. You know, it's hard. It can be very, very hard. Yeah. So I, I'd love to hear about Lama Dawa because he was a Nagpa. And can you speak of the meaning of that and also what the role of a Nagpa is in community? Yeah, sure. Nakba literally means a mantra dara, somebody who holds mantra. Mantra dara would be like the Sanskrit equivalent of the Tibetan word nak. Nak means mantra, speech, mantra. So they're mantra holders, you know, people who have perfected mantra and have can perform all kinds of, you could say, magical activities. So they're generally seen as people with some kind of sid siddhi you know, some kind of accomplishment through their practice, but it is a tradition. And, and one of the things I forgot to mention, like in the Kipashi, is that Nakpa also includes women. Like that word is kind of like the English word mankind, right? But if you want to speak specifically of a woman, you would say Nakmo, right? If you're talking about an individual person who's a woman, Nakmo, so nakba, nakmo, but as a tradition, we say nakba, right? So it includes both men and women. And so, and in, you know, in Tibetan culture, you could say in the cultures throughout the Himalayas, we say Tibetan, but there's Bhutan and Sikkim and Ladakh and Nepal and, you know, Mongolia, you know, there's many of these kind of Buddhist oriented cultures in the Himalayas that they served a very important role, especially in the remote village areas in that they, they performed all these services for the people. They needed to have healing abilities. So they were often well-versed in aspects of Tibetan medicine. Um, they had to control the weather. They had to make sure the crops grew on time. They had to control epidemic diseases among their flocks, their herds of yak, sheep, they, they, you know, if, if they had a, an epidemic that wiped them out, the Nakba would be blamed for that, you know, or if they had a hail that destroyed their crops, the Nakba would be blamed for that. So they had to have these kinds of abilities to work with elemental forces. And they also performed divinations. They, um, they handled all the cremation 
burial and uh, funeral services when a member of the village died. Um, they were often involved in legal matters, disputes, conflicts among the people in the villages. And so they had a pivotal role. And um, in the case of Lamadawa's father, who was a Nakba in the Dolpo region of Nepal, a very remote area that is now in Nepal, but it's sort of Tibetan, Nepal, ethnic groups there. And they paid him in a tax. So once a year, every family had to come and make these offerings like a 10th of their barley crop and a 10th of their butter and a 10th of fabrics. And so they supported the Nakba and in turn the Nakba, this is how they served the community. They didn't get paid, you know, in this, it wasn't that kind of transaction. It was this kind of interdependent relationship that the people had. And, you know, the story of Lama Dawa's father, he was a wandering Chutpa at the time. And this was before Lama Dawa was born, but Lama Pema Dorje was alive. Many people know Lama Pema Dorje. And they were wandering around, you know, Lama Dawa's father, mother, they were Chutpas. You know, she would give birth. They'd be on pilgrimage tour doing Chut. She'd go give birth and come back with her baby and just resume her Chut. I mean, just amazing. And they were in this area of Dolbo in this cave, this massive cave. And the local people said, oh, you don't want to go in there. That's haunted. You know, one time there was a whole like military or something was there and they all died and they, they didn't go in that cave because they were scared of it. And so he thought this is a perfect place to practice. So he, they set up camp there. And, you know, after several months of them being there and doing their chud, the local people started to notice that, gosh, you know, the weather's so nice and everything is going so well. Wow, you know, this Nakba really has energy. And so they actually requested him, please stay and be our Lama, because they, this very remote area, they were not, there was no monasteries nearby. And so he decided to stay and they built this three-story monastery in the cave. Um, and then he stayed and became the resident Lama, Nakba of nine different villages. And the Lama Dawa was born into that kind of setting up until he was nine years old he grew up in that with his father serving these villages and he sometimes would tell stories when his father was away he was you know he was the man of the house you know this little eight-year-old boy you know and they would all come to him and ask him to do these kinds of things because it's expected that the children especially the sons are going to learn this because it is a tradition that's passed down in the family line. And so my root teacher, Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche, who is also the quintessential Nakba, he used to say that there were two ways one becomes a Nakba, one is through family lineage. And that's, that's very important in Tibetan culture. And there are, there are prominent Nakba family lineages. And then the other is through your practice, right? So through going through the path of practice, and particularly when you're going through the traditional path through the Anu yoga, the yoga practices, and you start to gain some abilities, then you are, he would say you arrive on the stage of the Nakba, and then you can perform these kinds of um, practices. So those of us born in the West, <laughs> that's how we become Nakbas. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, just thinking of the amount of pressure, the, uh, to be, to be mm -hmm. responsible for the elements, that's just a whole mm -hmm. other level of responsibility. And I mean, it's also just so telling of this time, right? Like we all are actually responsible in many ways for the elements as well. Right. Yeah. And we, we don't accept that responsibility. They had such a close relationship with nature, you know, and they, they still do. And I, I think some of that comes through in some of these practical teachings that I've been giving these forces that are at play that we in the West, in our scientific materialistic culture, we don't acknowledge that these forces exist. And I have to say, that's one of the great gifts that I, as a Westerner foreigner, living amongst Nakbas came to believe and see, you know, the reality of this. And even though I was always sensitive to it, when I was a child, I was, you know, totally into the nature spirits. And so I, maybe I have a propensity or a sensitivity to it anyway, but their understanding of these forces is very deep and they know how to work with it. 
Do you have any examples of moments you've seen the elements worked with that were profound for you? Yeah, I mean, I can give some examples of my own teacher, Kunsang Dorje Rinpoche. There were, you know, there are times, there was one time we were all together and we had to go somewhere and the, the butter lamp on his shrine was burning and he, he didn't want, he was worried about leaving that while we went somewhere and he, he did something for that fire to be perfectly still. It stopped flickering. It was like frozen and we left and we came back and it was still where it was. The butter lamp hadn't burned. Nothing happened. It was completely frozen. And then he released it and it started burning again. So like this, you know, direct control of the elemental energies. And um, Lama Dawa tells a story when they were in Sikkim and it rain, 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 it rain. There are times when it's raining so much in Sikkim and they were going somewhere and Rinpoche made this special hat and he put it on his head and this group uh, walking outside and right over them, it didn't rain. You know, it was, it was as though they had this like huge umbrella over all of them, but it was this special hat. And so it wasn't raining on them as they were trekking up and down the mountains. And it was some special hat he made. He put it on his head. And then the, one of the guys who was with them, he really wanted that hat. Like, Rinpoche, I want your hat. And Rinpoche was like, here, you can have it. It's not actually the hat, you know. <laughs> but you can have it if you think you're going to put this hat on and it's going to do the same thing. I don't But here. You can have this hat. Like these kinds of uh stories and and certainly with living with somebody like Lama Dawa who had direct communication with them he would have visions all the time and um you know communicated with them regularly and they're you know like we have a number of them that live in our retreat land we we kind of know they're around and they make a little mischief for us and <laughs> little teorangs they say in Tibetan or leprechauns we would say <laughs> Mimi Sangbo, we have our resident resident leprechaun, and he's a little mischief maker. <laughs> well, so will you, since you spent so much time as a companion and uh, you know really assisting Lama Dawa in teachings, what were some things about him that really stood out to you, both you know as his way of being and his way of teaching? Mm-hmm. Well. You know, to start with, when I first met him, right, I was a nun and I met him in Oregon because I was going to a Buddhist healing seminar that a Western Lama was putting together. And they were all these, you know, medicine Buddha practice. And he invited Lama Dawa to come to give Tachakunsum empowerment, which is a deity within lineages that works with um, diseases from Naga specifically. That's how I met Lama Dawa. And I was so taken with his open and unabashed way of talking about these spirits because, and Dharma protectors, because my, at that time, the teachers I had in this monastic tradition in the Drigan Kagyu, I could never get them to talk about these things, you know, I'd want to talk about like these Dharma protectors, you know, I would be asking point and they were always a little hedgy like they didn't want to talk about this you know why was that what was the resistance and well i i later found out it's because tibetans believe if you name them you invoke them you know and that and actually in the monastic tradition they it's the nakbas that deal with this and it's the monasteries that give the nakbas the jobs to work with that mm. you know they're just different traditions and their their realm that they work in is different you know, and I think part of it was that. And I think part of it was just, I think there's a hesitancy on llamas to discuss this with Westerners because some of it's maybe controversial, especially with Dharma protectors, you know. But Lama Dawa was just open about everything and ex- answered all my questions, you know, that I've been trying to get answers to. And, and even things that you'd find in the Ghana Chakra feasts, you know, sort of provocative lines. What is this? And he was just very forthcoming with, you know, and obviously very comfortable with the material, you know. And so that was the first thing that impressed me. And also his, um, you know, he also was an Acharya. This made him very unique. 
He was not only a Nakba and an accomplished yogi, he had gone to Sanskrit University and did the whole philosophy to get his Acharya degree. So he had the scholastic academic background and he was a Nakba. This is very unique combination that you usually find one or the other. And so he was like an encyclopedia and so open and generous to share with us newbie Westerners about all this deep esoteric stuff. So that was one of the things that I was very um, taken with, um, this open, generous, unabashed willingness to talk about things. Um, the other thing was that he was kind of mad. He was very magical. You know, anyone around him, he really was like this elf, <laughs> you know, he obviously he was always in touch with this other realm and had direct communication and lived accordingly. You know, he it was hard for him to live in America. He you know, the only way he could be here was through me. He really didn't function on our time scale and our, you know, that it was one of the challenges of being married to him is, you know, I had to take care of everything. He didn't drive. He didn't, wasn't on the internet. It took him a long time before he would even use a telephone, making schedules and having this kind of, you know, organized way that we section off time is not how they are, you know, they're literally beating to a different drummer, you know, and so it was kind of like fitting a square peg in a round hole, sometimes very challenging. And for me, I always had one foot on both, you know, I had to manage this, getting him ready to go on an airplane to go fly somewhere, you know, and yet he's, he's completely in in sync with different things and there were sometimes at the last minute he would say no we can't do this you know because he would get messages you know very spontaneous he'd wake up and say I you know do you remember she came to me in my dream and we have to do this just now we have to do a retreat right now and I'd have to drop everything and have everything ready and then we'd have to do this practice right now you know like this kind of paying attention to different signs and signals that we don't pay attention to because we're locked into this kind of conventional time frame and our schedules and taking care of our bills and our household things. <laughs> you know, So it was kind of, in, it was very interesting. He really lived, uh, he was very magical that way. And, you know, that's how other people, he loved to tell stories. He had these great stories and he had these wonderful twinkling eyes that just, you know, or just drew you right into his, his magical realm. <laughs> yeah. And how has it been for you? You know, cause he passed in 2017. Yeah. Past, how has it been then just shifting in, just thinking of what you're just sharing now, kind of having feed in both realms. What is it like for you now? Well, it's definitely a transition, you know, it's certainly a transition for me because I've been left with this responsibility. You know, I, in 2011, I was enthroned and actually 2008, I was enthroned by Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche in 2011. And so I knew that I had to continue his work, right? So, so I have a very strong sense of um, the responsibility of continuing what he set out to do. Um, and, you know, I feel his presence so strongly and I'm very protected, you know, so, you know, and I, and I get these intuitive messages and, but it's not this, you know, I cannot step into his shoes, you know, it's like, and I always knew from my teachers when they said, now, you know, when we're gone, when I'm gone and Lama Dao's gone, you have to teach this in your land. So I'm very aware that I'm not Tibetan, you know, and I, so I take the essence of what I've learned and how to translate that into our culture. And that's, that's sort of my challenge, you know, trying to find the language, trying to find the, mm, the relevance. What are the relevance of these old teachings that can seem to be some archaic culture from the past? How is it relevant to us now? Well, it is because it's describing a, a whole dimension of reality that we don't normally take into consideration that very much is at play with, you know, what's going on in the world right now, you know, so 
I think it is relevant. <laughs> so it's my, my task and my challenge. And I'm certainly learning as I go along. And, but I'm very much guided by him. You know, I'm very much I'm clear about what, what to accept and what to reject and the path and what they wanted, you know, his idea. Because he wanted for us this whole Nakba tradition, he wanted for us Westerners to be able to do all these things. Like he's like, don't depend on the lamas over in Asia to do these things for you. You have to learn how to do these things, the, pra the kind of practical things. And so he dedicated himself to teaching his students how to perform simple things like the Kebashi, but even the students who had been going on the path of practice to how to conduct the fire pujas and do some of the more advanced ritual practices that are activities. These are activity practices. It's very important that we know how to do these things. And like many times he made precious pills, mindrup, precious pills, because he wants us to know how to do this. In the future, you have to make these things. You have to continue the lineage of these sacred substances, right? So he he put a lot of effort and dedication into teaching. And I sometimes feel like we didn't do enough to absorb it, you know? It's like, that's my regret. It's like, oh, you know, he's gone, you know? So, but you just do the best you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In 1999, you traveled to Nepal to meet with Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche, a renowned, mm. as you mentioned, Nyingmapa, Salung, and Dzogchen master. And mm. can you speak about him, both what you know of him as a yogi and your personal experience with him? Yeah, sure. I became aware of him when Lama Dawa, when I invited Lama Dawa to come to Maryland, it was in 1998 when I met Lama Dawa. You know, and then I was like, I have to invite him to come to our center in Maryland. And he came and, and taught there. And then at that time, he told me, you have to come to Nepal because I want you to meet my teacher, Kunzang Gorje Rinpoche. So he's putting the bug in my ear like, I don't know who Kunzang Gorje Rinpoche is, but he had a picture of him. And I saw this picture and I thought, oh, I just saw myself like, oh, yeah, I'm going to meet him. Like this kind of, oh. And so then it was the year after 1999, Lama Dawa and I did this exhausting tour in the U.S. and then went to Nepal. Then that I went to Nepal and Lama Dawa took me to meet him. So I kind of had this anticipation, like, who is this mythical figure? Of course, I've heard all these stories from Lama Dawa. And um, so I'd heard these things and saw pictures. And so I was, you know, like, wow, you know feeling this anticipation. He lived in Parping at the time. And so we took the taxi to see him and I'll, you know, it was one of those incredible moments, you know, our eyes met and it was time and space collapsing. And I just like, I know you very like this inexplicable knowing. And, um, you know, he looks at me and nods and I go up into his room and the first thing he did, you know, he's sitting on his, the Tibetan couches that they sit on and he reaches under his bed and he has this big plastic bag full of photographs, just all kinds of photographs just thrown into a plastic bag. And he pulls out these photograph, beautiful picture of a lake in Northern Tibet. I don't know where it is, but it's this beautiful scenic picture. Somebody must've given it to him. And that this all like sparse mountains and this crystalline blue lake. And in the front is like horns of a yak in the sand, you know, like a skull. And he shows me this picture. And, and I didn't speak Tibetan at the time. So Lama Dao was translating. And he's like, what, where is this? Where is this? I don't know. You know, I'm looking at this picture, but I could feel the tears coming. I don't know where this is. I, and then he pulls out another picture with the one with the yak on it. And he's like, what's that? And I say, oh, that's a yak, you know, and Lama Dao was like, no, that's a dong, dong, the wild yak. Like, so he's like, where is this? But I didn't know, but the tears are, I don't know why these tears are coming. And then it was later that Lama Dao was said, oh, he's showing you those pictures because that's where you were in your past life. Because he had known me when he was a young man in Tibet in the 1940s and 50s. I apparently... I was there and he knew me 
so we had this kind of personal connection that uh, got kind of validated to me but that's how he kind of present he didn't say i know you oh no here's a picture where is this who is that you know that's <laughs> and even though i my conceptual mind didn't know the tears are coming right so something new <laughs> Anyhow, so that's how he was, you know, he, um, he had perfect, what they say in Tibetan, Moshe, Moshe means clairvoyance, like clairvoyance, telepathy, he would look at you and know everything you're thinking, he knew everything about you, he knows all the secrets you're hiding, don't lie to him, because he will know. You know, he had this kind of ability to, to just look at you and know everything about you. And um, he used to test us. <laughs> well, Madawa, you know, because a lot of his students, well, I want to meet Kunzang Roger Rinpoche. They come to Nepal and, you know, they'd get to meet Rinpoche and Rinpoche would give them the same test. You know, they'd be kneeling in front of Rinpoche and Rinpoche is looking down at them. And he'd say, if you're, let's say you're a woman, how many boyfriends you have? he'd ask you how many boyfriends you had you'd see the surprise look on their face and then then the calculating going on in their mind you know and and you have to like come up with a number right like how many boy and of course what he meant was how many people you had sex with right and you had to come up with this number and if you didn't come up with the right number he would say oh you're a liar what about this one you forgot this one and he would very specifically say and it's some kind of scenario oh and you just look at these people's faces but he would test people this way and it was his way of knowing is this person going to be honest with me or are they going to tell are they going to hide stuff you know and he would be very confrontative with people who tried to hide and lie or deflect that's how he was so some people considered him to be a wrathful llama because he's very confrontational. It doesn't let you get away with, you know, kind of telling a lie or exaggerating or trying to hide something. This was very, very important to him that you be very transparent and very honest. That's how you gain the trust of teachers like this. And, um, but he had this ability and, you know, Lama Dao and I would you know, I'd be in Nepal for six months doing retreat, and then we'd go back to the U.S. and tour around. And while we were in the U.S., Rinpoche, sometimes he would have somebody call us and want to talk to us, and he knew what we were doing. He knew who we were with, and he'd be like, how come you said such and such to this person? Why are you done like this? Like, how could he possibly know? You know, we're halfway across the world. But he know he knew where we were and what we were doing and what we were saying to people. <laughs> So he's like this kind of, this kind of Siddha, you know, this kind of Moshe. And um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how he was. So, you know, he was, a lot of people were afraid of him. A lot of Tibetans, he never had a lot of students. You know, he was a difficult teacher. But for me, that's what I wanted. I wanted a no-nonsense teacher that wasn't going to let me get away with <laughs> the little games that we always play. We play games all the time, even with ourselves, you know, uh, that ego mind is always wanting to deflect and make stories and manipulate our circumstances. <laughs> but he, you know, he was the teacher. He wasn't going to let you get away with it, you know, and, and you know, it was difficult. You know, he didn't live up to your expectations. You know, sometimes he would say, you know, come at this time and where well, I'm going to give you these teachings and, you know, I'd have to get all ready and I'd show up and he'd be like, man, go away. Not today, you know, and I'd be all angry, like, all right. <laughs> so, like this, these kind of teachers that don't live on your agenda. You cannot manipulate them. You cannot, you cannot seduce them. You cannot, you know wheel and deal with them these kind of teachers very solid in who they are and one of the reasons why i had i had so much devotion to him and also lama dawa is because they had the capacity to be critical of their own culture actually you know they weren't even playing the tibetan game you know every culture we have our game that we play to get ahead and 
you know, to become well known or to have a certain position in society. And they didn't care less about this and always avoided this. You know, Kunzang Gorgia Rinpoche had many opportunities to have an important position and he always turned away from it and chose the life of, of a, you know, all yogi that, you know, in his early days wandered from place to place. In the later days, he lived in our house. The last nine years of his life, he lived in our house and um, till he passed away and we cremated his body on the roof of our house. I just appreciate so much about what you're sharing, your personal yeah. desire to not be able to fool around and to not be able to deceive yourself or manipulate the situation. I think that came as a result of the experience I had when I read Yeshi Sogil's life story and I saw that my life I was living was a lie and how I had constructed this lie, even though I thought I had a perfect life. I'm never leaving. This is perfect. But it was a lie. And, and then from that experience, or you know, this idea of renunciation that's so important in Buddhism is really when you're just sick of going around in circles. You know, there's something in you that I'm just tired of. I don't want to do go around in circles anymore. Something very deep recognizes the the kind of fallacy of it you know it's like the things you thought were the ambitions you had are really not that important something happens when you have that kind of experience of real renunciation and for me it was this book that triggered it for other people it's other triggers or it comes as a as a result of doing deep meditative practices and realizing emptiness this important idea of seeing through the the solidity of things and um so then then it's like you don't want to fool around anymore <laughs> i don't want to waste any more time i was already in my 30s and so i think that's why it's like no i un unconsciously like these are the teachers i need the ones that aren't going to play games the ones that also well, the thing i appreciated about him and lama dawa is i didn't see them really using their students you know, and I, I do see a certain amount of this, the teachers, they, they, you know, they want students to be their worker bees, to work for their projects, you know, to, of course, bring money for their monasteries. There's a certain element of that that goes on. They didn't care about this. They were poor and they didn't have this kind of ambition. They had no monasteries to fund. They had no big organizations to run. They were completely outside of this and so I never felt that I was being used or taken advantage of that they truly had my best interest in my as long as I demonstrated the dedication to the path they it's almost like they could see my potential even I, even if I couldn't see it you know and that that's what they were relating to you know so I think that that goes along with those experiences of just being tired of <laughs> samsara. And then you find a teacher who also was tired of samsara, <laughs> not really playing the game. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you're, you were just talking about how An Kunzung Dorje lived with you until his passing. Mm -hmm. And also I know during that time, you did a lot of retreat with him. You mentioned the six months during that one period of time. Um, so you received with him the entire cycles of teachings and empowerments of the Riggs and Sugdrib lineage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you speak about that particular lineage? And, and also if there's anything you'd be willing to share about the, sure. the particular Salong and Tumo from that lineage as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, he came to live with us after we um, built a house in Boda and he moved in in 2002. 2001, like on the cusp of 2001, 2002, and he lived on the top floor. It's a four story house that every story is its own apartment. And he moved in on the fourth floor and we lived on the third floor. And he and his wife, uh, Ani Sampel, we call her, uh, moved upstairs from Parping up into. And so we then were taking care of them in, in the end of their life. And um, yeah, and so I for many years from 1999, my first trip, excuse me, spent five, six months in Nepal and was mostly in retreat, you know, so I have done the equivalent of a three-year retreat, but it was six months on, six months off, six months on, six months off. It was kind of divided like this. 
And so while I'm in Nepal, I'm, I'm in retreat working on this path of practice. And I actually went through the Dujum tear first, finishing the Dujum, the short Dujum Nundro, then the medium length Nundro, and then doing the generation stage practice of the Dakini, the Kondratuktik, and then Guru Soki Dorje, and then Vajra Kalaya. And that was under Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche's um, supervision, you know, so first I went through the three roots of the Dujum lineage and um, in the generation stage practice. And then from there, he had me segue into the Riggs and subgroup and go right into the Anu Yoga of Vajra Varahi in the Riggs and subgroup lineage, which is his main lineage. You know, when he was in Tibet, he, that was his main practice. Um, and of course, he's also a Dujum Lama, you know, but the Riggs and Sogdrup was his kind of special lineage that he held. And, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, um, he was recognized at that time when the Tibetans were trying to, you know, reconstruct their lineages that both the Dalai Lama and Dujum Rinpoche recognized Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche to be the kind of premier Nyingmapa Salong lineage holder at that time. He was in Sopema and requested him to lead a group of people in three-year retreats to pass on his lineage. So, you know, that was kind of recognized early on. And so, so fast forward, you know, it's 2006, seven, eight, like this, and I've been doing these retreats in Nepal. And then, so then he decided that now it's time for me to go to, to the Riggs and So group. So I first did the Tsalung, in the Riggs and Sog group under him. And then after that, I did the Tsalung in the Khandra Tuktik, and that was under Lama Pema Dorje. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I went into the Tsalung in the Vajra Kalaya, and that was under Lopin Namgyal Rinpoche. And that was actually Shempendawa Rinpoche sent me to him to get the uh, Vajra Kalaya Tsalung. That was in 2017, actually. And um, I was a little bit too old, but I had to do it. <laughs> so, but yeah, the Riggs and Sodrup, um, it's a really special lineage. And, um, but it's kind of the main lineage of Sikkim. You know, if you go to Sikkim, these monasteries are all practicing in the Riggs and Sodrup pujas. And Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche led a three-year retreat in Sikkim to bring these yogic traditions, the inner Salong and Tumo, back into Sikkim because they had lost the yogic tradition. So that's one of the things about these lineages is they have these inner yogic practices that are kind of specialties and not everybody practices Salong. That's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize. It's a specialty practice that only certain people will do. And so you have the yogis that are holding that part of a lineage. And so Rinpoche's job and it was also prophesized by Guru Rinpoche that he would do this. He would strengthen the Tumo because it would go very weak as a result of this, you know, refugee situation of the communists coming in and destroying. So he, you know, he did that in Sikkim to, to strengthen this. And, um, but he, because he had recognized me also as an emanation of Nigar Paldron, which I didn't know until many years later. It was actually at the time that he decided I needed to have the Riggs and Sogdrup. That's when he told me, he's like, this is your share. You have to take this. You know, you have to do this. <laughs> so, so yeah, then he was, he, over a period of several years when I was in Nepal, my training with him, it was interesting because he wanted to do it undercover because his other Tibetan students were very jealous, actually. Rinpoche was giving me many, many teachings. Why he, Why he's giving it to this American lady? And oh, it must be because she's Lama Dawa's wife. Or, so he, what he would do is at night when everybody would go home, and if you've ever been to Nepal, you know, they all lock their gates. They have like bars on the windows and bars on the door. Everybody goes home when it gets dark and everybody locks up. And then after dinner, I would go upstairs to the fourth floor with Lama Dawa and I would get teachings late into the wee hours of the morning. And this would go on day after day after day. And then I would go down in my room and I'd be practicing and people didn't know this, you know, life would go on around and I'm in my room 
doing the practices until he would call me up again. And I again go up at night. And this is how this is how it happened for many years. And I was told at the time, you don't tell anybody that I'm doing this because there was a lot of jealousy, actually. And it wasn't until later then he opened this. And um, but that's how I, I had my training with him over the course of those years and went through the the Riggs and Sodrup um, Anu Yoga practices. You know, the, the Salabong is just a part of Anu Yoga, right? And, and Anu Yoga is the Tumo. The Tumo is the first part of all these yoga practices. And then the Tsa Lung, or sometimes you say Trul Core, is just one practice. It's the outer physical exercises that are used to remove the, the um, obstacles in the channel so that you can actually accomplish the Tumo. The Tumo is the main practice, which is all kind of visualization um, and breath work, certain kinds of breath work, but the trill cores and the movements are to help remove obstacles in the channels to make it easier to accomplish those practices. And so, yeah, and so, and then after that comes the other branch practices, the illusory body practice and bardo and dream yoga. Those are branch practices. The Pumo is the main one. So many years are spent on this, actually. There's outer, inner, and secret levels of this. And um, and then after that are these branch practices. And Could you so, speak yeah. the outer, inner, and secret levels of Tumo? Yeah, sure. I mean, the outer level of, is like the trulcor, right? The exercises, that's what uh, more people are becoming familiar with now because it's being taught a little more openly. And um, so they say trulcor movements and exercises and... Um, but they, you know, the thing is that I, I always like to remind people that these true cores are associated with deities, right? And so even though they're they're kind of being taught, I see people teaching them and people are learning the moves, they are actually done in the context of sadhana. You are the deity doing those exercises. You have to be that. That's, you know, and if you're just doing the exercises and you're not meditating that you're the deity, it's you can't really call this salum. I mean, it's something else. That's a very important point. And so, in order to do those practices, you have to do the Maha Yoga stage of generating yourself as the deity until you have what they call pride of the deity, mm -hmm. right? And that is actualizing yourself, your nature is the nature of the deity, and stabilizing your meditation in that. And of course, when you're doing these generation stage retreats where you're sitting in sadhana and you're reciting millions of mantras and enacting this visualization, you're sitting, right? So it's, you know, it's one thing to, to sort of abide in a meditative state when you're sitting, but now in the salon, you got to move around and maintain this meditation of yourself as the deity while you're jumping around, <laughs> you know, and so, but that's, that's the key. The key is you are the deity. And then there's practices of what they call the tongra, the empty body practices that your, your body is this transparent. And then from that arises the subtle energy system, the central channel and the chakras. And what's very interesting is in that tradition, Tibetans never talk about chakras and channels until they get to that point in their practice. So it's kind of interesting that there's, there's not even interested in it. Like we in the West, we're so fascinated with subtle energy and chakras and channels. And we learn, we want to learn all about it. But in the way that it's traditionally taught, it's like, until you get to those practices, they don't really care about it. You know, it's often the first time that they're even introduced to these ideas, you know, because that's when you're going to use those visualizations in the context of those practices. And, and the other thing I see Westerners getting a little bit confused about is all these descriptions of chakras and channels are different depending on which tantric cycle and which deity and which practice you're doing. And people get confused about that. And this text, it says, you know, the crown chakra is this color. And how come in this text, it's another color or it has different numbers or, you know, some people will say, you know, the right, the, the two Kyangma Roma, the right is 
white and the left is red or it's reversed. It's like people get, they don't understand that those are just skillful means for you to work with your energy. That doesn't, it's not an anatomy class that that's how it is. You're not talking about anatomy, <laughs> like a fixed thing that you're constructing it with your mind. It's what you're meditating on to create these experiences, right? Like in, a lot of people are familiar with POA, right? And so in POA, they tell you to visualize the crown chakra opening up like a trumpet, you know, so that you can, you can open this area, right? It's not saying that that's how it actually is, but to help you get those experiences, it'll describe your subtle energy. So, you know, that's something that you kind of realize when you're doing these practices that this subtle energy system we're working with is just light and sound and we're creating it. We're, we're making it this way through the practices that we're doing. And by med by meditating on the, the tongra, this body that becomes our form, we're creating this form body. And from that arises this deity, you know, and so, and then all these exercises you're doing, you're doing it from the meditation that you're the deity doing this. That's absolutely essential. It's not your meat body. My, my teacher would say your meat body. <laughs> it's not your meat body jumping around. You know, he used to say even Olympic athletes, they have very perfect solemn, but they know nothing. You know, it's not about athleticism at all, or even how well you can do some of the difficult moves It has to do with your meditative absorption on yourself as the deity. And so one of the things that helps you to stabilize that is lear learning the boom chen, the vase breath, right? The vase breath comes in, you start learning and training in the vase breath. And all that is, is to stabilize your shamatha. That's what it is. While you're moving around and jumping around, you're holding this vase. That's your pranic energy to hold the mind while you're moving around. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, just deepening your meditation. It's all skillful means to deepen your meditation so that you realize your true nature. That's all, all these practices lead to that, right? And Salong is just a really complicated, <laughs> complex system of working, employing all of your body, speech, and mind onto the path. It's a path of effort. You know, they call it the path of effort. Because it is, it's hard. It's really hard. And I was kind of older. I was 45 when I started training in it. And that's kind of old, <laughs> you know, and I know that some traditions in, in Tibet in the old days, if you were older than 30, they wouldn't teach this to you. And I think the Drukpa Kagyu still hold that rule. They feel that if you're older than 30, your channel, uh, this is something that uh, Jitsuma Tenzin Pomo shared with me you know, that your channels have already degenerated and it's too dangerous because there's a lot of really um, tough moves. You could definitely damage your spine, your knees, your joints. Um, and if you're older, you're more prone to those injuries and injuries do happen. Absolutely do happen. Do you, and considering that you've done so many salongs, have uh, so many different versions of Salong with different traditions. Do you feel that that's the case or do you think it's, is it an outdated notion to not begin Salong after 30? It's definitely outdated. And my guru told the story when he was first asked to teach Salong in Sopema in the sixties to open your lineage and Dujra Rinpoche collected, I think a group of 13 lamas and among them was Lama Tarchin and Lama Pema Dorje. And there were some other ones I don't remember. So, but one Lama, Nakba Sharab Dorje, who some people will know because he was said to be Lama Tarchin's uncle. He was of the Repkon Nakba, as you see these pictures of him with these big dreadlocks. He was 55 years old at the time. And he wanted to be in that course. And Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche said, no, you're too old. So Nakba Sharab Dorje went to Duja Rinpoche and complained. He's like, I want to be in that course. You know, you have to. He was a very forceful guy, apparently. So Duja Rinpoche told Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche, just let him be in it. You know, just make him happy. It's, it'll be a good blessing. Well, 
he was the best one. He outdid those young guys, you know? And so my teacher changed his view because that was like a rule they had. They, maybe they didn't even, but here, so not for sure, Dorje kind of proved to him that, you know, sometimes the age doesn't matter. And then Rinpoche said to me, you know, you Westerners are healthy, you know, like this. And he also felt since I had some past life propensity for this, apparently in my past life, when he knew me, I was a six yogas of Naropa teacher for the Tagum Kagyu. So I had some kind of karmic propensity for it. So he made those exceptions. And so, but now I see lamas are making those exceptions. And, you know, the last training I did with um, Lopin Namgyal Rinpoche, that was with 30 other of his students in Nepal. There was a couple people older than me. Most, most of them were very young, young meaning 20s, 30s. Um, but there were some older people. So I have found that they've, the Nyingmapas have relaxed that rule. But I do think the Drukpa Kagyu still adhere to that because it is true. There's, you, you can really hurt yourself you know, during, during, they're very hard, very difficult practices. And they don't, um, they're always done in the coldest time of year. You know, they calculate astrologically when it's going to be the coldest time because you're, con you're conjoining it with Tumo practice. And so you're out there in these little skirts and, you know, you're naked, basically sitting out there in the freezing cold. And uh, there's no warm ups like in the West, we warm up before. We, oh, no, <laughs> there's no warm ups, you know, so it's hard on the joints, it's hard on the ligaments. And that's the other thing is like, you don't practice this the rest of your life. My teachers didn't. It's a course that you're doing, right? You're going through this course and it's part of the outer Salom, this outer inner secret levels, right? So it's the outer level of proficiency. And when certain signs come, then you're working on the inner levels, right? So the inner levels are working with pipes, the therma or vajroli, they would call it. And so that's a, that's a very different practice. And then the secret level is a consort practice. So in the inner level, you're learning to control the, the flows of the, of the lower door, they say the lower door wins, you're learning how to breathe in and out. And then after that, you're working with a consort. And um, that's the, you know, and then after that, you're going on to the other yoga practices, very short, you know, for me, it was the, the dream yoga, illusory body, these are, they, they don't spend much time in them because they're branch practices. And then it goes into the ati, you're into the ati, the graduated path, as I was trained in this graduated path. Do you have any thoughts on tending to the body from a yogic perspective? Yeah, I mean, there are lujong. There are traditions of nejong and lujong, which maybe come from Tibetan medicine. Those are great for maintaining body health, right? And they aren't dependent on a deity yoga cycle. Because again, what I was training in is part of a path of practice. In, in situ with that tradition, right? So they're associated with deity yoga and any deity cycle, whether it's chakra sambara or whether it's vajra kalaya, they all have their solo part of their cycle. It's part of the anu or the completion stage, the zogrim. They all have a solo. So ha, this training that I'm talking about is part of that tradition. But besides that, there are Lujong exercises. There are Neijong now that Tibetan medicine and they draw from, there's some similar things, mm -hmm. absolutely similar things, sure. you know, and there's some parts of the um, Salong that are the preliminary steps of Salong. Sometimes I teach those because they're nice ways to warm up the joints, just taking them out as like a separate practice. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, I think it's important to make a distinction, at least in my case. And of course, I'm only talking from my own experience. Like, I don't claim to be an expert on this. I'm not a scholar. I only know what I've been taught by my teachers who were old school yogis. And this is how they were taught in Tibet. But the Salong that I was taught is part of this bigger tradition. And it wasn't taken, it wasn't taken out of context and then practiced as some separate thing, right? So... But I know that there are solemns being taught that are just these exercises and they don't 
necessarily they aren't part of the bigger path you know so yeah, <laughs> so i have to make that kind of disclaimer just so people are clear when i'm saying solemn this is what i mean i think that's great and i just like the differentiation between you know the neijung and the lojung people can yeah lean in that direction potentially if they're interested in the physical aspects versus you know yeah. being involved in a cycle a, a deity deity associated yeah, and i think things like this yantra yoga by namkai norbu that's also a system right mm -hmm. there's other systems mm -hmm. that other lamas have taught that are probably excellent for physical health and that's important it is really important to keep ourselves fit because if if we're in pain, it's hard to sit and do practice. You know, if we're not feeling clear and vibrant, we need this. In speaking about Salong, can you share about subtle energetic systems? Well, I mean, they all share the idea that there's the central channel and there's two side channels, which yeah. are masculine and feminine. And they're sort of the, the first division of, of a unified whole. The central channel is like the absolute nature. And that absolute then divides into these two polarities, feminine, masculine, or solar and lunar. Sometimes they use the solar and lunar channels. So that's like, that's our core, right? That, and that's largely what we're working with. And then from there, branch off to other channels in particular places, the crown, the throat, the heart, the navel, like this. There's usually five main centers in the Buddhist tradition. Mm -hmm. that are where channels branch off and they, you know, and then they spread all through the body and they go beyond the body out the pores of the skin, right? So every place we have a hair, there's little micro channels, you know, radiating out and that creates our aura. Like we feel this auric field. That's actually part of our subtle body with all these micro channels radiating out, right? So but I think that's a kind of generalized, um, they all share that idea. And then in those channels are circulating wind. When they say wind in Tibetan, you could say prana, um, but they use the word wind. And those are divided into five major kinds. And then there's five kinds that power the senses, the, the hearing and the smelling. And so those are circulating and they actually are associated with some physical functions like the downward, the wind, they call the downward voiding wind that flows from the root down is associated with elimination, right? Elimination. So, you know, peeing and, you know, passing um, poop <laughs> and a woman's menstrual cycle and orgasm, you know, anything that's sort of outward um, from the lower. And then there's winds like the upward moving wind that's responsible for breath you know, the, so they have physical correlations that have to do with our metabolic functions of the physical body, for sure. Um, but they also can be used to fuel different kinds of experience, spiritual experiences, you know, and so then in the, in the Tumo, specifically, we're working with a masculine feminine force that's in the navel and in the crown. So they would say the red and the white elements, you know, and it's this way of bringing these two forces together and engendering certain experiences and then spreading those experiences through all the chakra systems. And then, you know, these different, they call blisses, right? So there's different experiences of bliss and then they have their counterpart of emptiness. It's always bliss. And then that's the kind of motive force that pushes you to go beyond into an experience of emptiness. Right. So it's a practice that's you really using the experience of bliss to actualize emptiness because bliss and emptiness are always two sides of the same coin. That's the Thumo way. But you can also people who are very deep meditators of shamatha vipassana, they can have the same experience, but they're doing it through the emptiness way. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can either do it through body energy or you do it through mental meditation samadhi but they go to the same place. They really go to the same place. And the Tumo and the Tsalong are just a skillful means of a way to get there, right? But it's not actually necessary. And from people from a high Dzogchen perspective will say that those are lower practices. Those are for slow pokes. <laughs> those are for people of low capacity, 
who don't have the capacity to just arrive in samadhi through the force of their meditative concentration. They got to do all this hard work to get there. You know, that's a perspective. Long Tempa says this, you know, Dujum Lingpa also, well, you know, if you can't, then go do some solemn. <laughs> you know, so just depends on your perspective, but it's just a, it's a very skillful method to purify. Okay. So it's purifying the five winds, which is to say you're purifying the five poisons to realize the five wisdoms. There's all these kind of expressions in the Buddhist tradition, but it really is to actualize your true nature and to, to kind of remove all of the veils that are um, in the way of you actualizing your true nature, which is kind of symbolized by the central channel, right? The central channel is kind of like where we're trying to um, actualize that um, source point of who we really are. And all the other, you know, things are just elaborations getting in the way. But we, you know, we always li we live on the surface of things, right? don't we? I mean, just our own caught in thoughts and caught in, we're not living from our center and our core. We're not living from that absolute state. We're always caught up in, you know, elaboration. Mm -hmm. So, so the Salong is using our mind's natural tendency to elaborate, <laughs> to make very elaborate visualizations to bring us into the core. <laughs> It's will, you speak, will you speak more to about the blisses, like the, the connection between the navel and the crown in particular around bliss emptiness? Well, the, 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 the navel red essence is what we get from our mother at the time of conception. And then the white essence of the crown is our, the essence we get from our father. So at the moment of conception, these two these two are the same and then they split and that forms the central channel as an embryo, right? So they, they kind of separate and then, then that's where they're situated. And so it's our way of bringing those back together in unity. You know, it's, it's a way of bringing that together in unity, but in, in the meantime, along the way where all these concentrated plexus of channels are concentrated inside there's also a constellation of what they call bindus or tiglis. These are sort of drops of pure awareness mm. that they coalesce in these areas. And so they become activated and that's what gives rise to what you could call it an experience of bliss, right? And so, and that can happen with, you know, shamatha meditation, one of the the keynote signs of arriving on these jhanic states is bliss, luminosity, and non-conceptuality. So the experience of bliss is, is a result of our stilling the noise, you know, of the conceptual thought to come into the true essence of who we are. And that is a, it's naturally experienced as bliss. It's a natural state. We have this capacity is our natural um, being the bliss of joy you know bliss is kind of a funny word you know but it is a physical sensation right it's not just an emotional state it's a distinct physical sensation and of course the closest thing the closest metaphor we have is sexual orgasm but that's even kind of crude <laughs> compared to the experience of bliss because that can be experienced anywhere in the body. And it actually can be experienced off the body. You know, you can experience bliss in your auric field. You know, it's not localized. And so, but, you know, there are places that are known to um, easily engender it because there's a concentration of tigli in those areas. And so, therefore, the tumo practice is this systematic way they call the melting and the dripping to access this and to activate this. And each one has a different name and they have a different quality. And, you know, it kind of, you become like a connoisseur, you know, like a wine taster can taste wine and they know like what year it was from and, you know, what kind of grape it was. Like this, you start to, you know, bliss is bliss, but then you start to like get into like hmm, a subtle 
differences between them and you have to learn this, you know, and because they also give rise to different forms of emptiness, right? There's not just emptiness, there's actually different qualities of emptiness and you start to refine that and come to know that. Closing the retreat sharing, you know, you being in the same space as your teacher on the floor underneath. I'm curious just as yeah. you're doing the practices, because, you know, not many people have such an intimate experience with their teacher in that way where they can really mm-hmm. progress at the rate that they're really ripe for. You know, it's interesting because it took me a long time before I realized how unique my situation was because I was kind of in this very insular thing and I thought everybody practiced that way. But actually, traditionally, that's how it was. Like even in the three-year retreat centers, you had the retreat master actually living with you. And I've come to know that that's not even the case, even in places like Bhutan and they, you know, the teachers usually jet setting all over the world and they'll come and give the students a bunch of teachings and then they leave and then they're kind of left to their own devices to kind of go continue with the teachings. Maybe there's a senior student there that can, you know, help them with some things, but it is, it, it's kind of that, that model, which is the real apprentice model or dis- guru disciple model is kind of rare I realized that and I I didn't but at the time I just thought everybody was doing like this but it's true I all my retreats I had direct supervision with my teacher who was checking in on me all the time and it meant that you know as soon as I started to go astray I would get corrected constantly but also what happens when you're in retreat and you're starting to give rise to certain experiences, there is a whole lineage of sacred oral instructions. And this is something my teacher used to emphasize and he used to say this lineage was dying and they are the direct teachings your teacher gives you at the time because they see that certain maturity is happening in your mind and you will get a, a different set of instructions that are not in the text. You know, you're still doing the basic sadhana, but then because certain experiences are arising, the instructions change. And that's an oral lineage that most people don't, they don't realize this. And my guru has always scolded me when they saw me reading a book. You know, it's like, don't hang in the bookish knowledge, they would say, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, but that's what most people have. They have books and texts and lots of wonderful scholars doing translations and they're depending on texts. But what I can say is that especially texts that have to do with these yogic practices is they're just basic outlines. They're just cliff notes, really. I mean, I don't know how people could do practice just from that because there's so much to it that is explained to you at the time or demonstrated to you at the time. And some of it is dependent on what, what you're experiencing. For good or for bad, if you're having difficulty and obstacles, different remedies are going to be given to you. Or if you're if you're starting to have maybe more advanced experiences, then different practices are going to be given to you at the time. And that is the advantage of doing practice that way. But I think it's very difficult. I think only the people you have to spend a lot of time with your teacher right? You really have to live with a teacher and spend a lot of time. And of course, that's always the way it was. It's not so much anymore. But um, that's the that's the value of serving your teacher, like the, the traditional thing, you serve your teacher, you spend all this time with your teacher, because you're going to get these more detailed instructions and personalized instructions for you. But that's what they call the lineage of oral instructions. And that's a it's, it's a, it's a real lineage. You know, my guru was taught this from his teacher taught from his teacher all the way back. It's not, they make it up in their mind. It's not something they just spontaneously come up with. Oh no, this comes from this lineage and it's not written down. Sometimes they get written down. There's some times when those kinds of things get written down and then they're made as like a commentary and, you know, but there's a there's a very alive and viable lineage of oral instruction that's you know unless you're doing these kinds of retreats you're not going to have much con- the teachers aren't going to teach this from the get-go 
you know, when you're in and you're really cooking, <laughs> you know, then they're going to add this little spice because <laughs> you're really cooking, you know, so. What do you think about just this day and age? I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of having access to teachers, yogic masters? I think there still are yogic masters, but you've got to make the effort to go find them. And you've got to be willing to move and change your life and make sacrifices. Oh, no, they're still there. I don't, I don't think that they've disappeared. I just think you're, you know, how willing, because I made a lot of sacrifices. I sacrificed everything, gave up everything to follow my teachers and you know, moved to Nepal, Mary Lama Dao. It was not easy, you know. There were sacrifices I made. And um, I think if you're, you have, again, this renunciation experience and that, that true wish, right, that heartfelt wish and aspiration, plus past life aspirations. Like, don't forget all these aspiration prayers that we chant all the time. You know, may I never be separate from my guru, may blah, blah, blah. We're chanting these aspiration prayers, and we probably did in a past life. Those aspiration prayers will come true, right? And you will meet that, but but don't miss the chance, because some people do meet, and they kind of, eh, they didn't look the way they thought they should look, or the teacher didn't give me that special attention I was looking for, and a lot of Westerners don't actually know how to um, recognize what kind of qualities a teacher should have. They look for the wrong things. You know, they look for teachers who are famous or charismatic, or they wrote lots of books, or they're popular, or 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 the or their te- or the teachers kind of treating them nice or something. They sometimes overlook the ones who have the real. Because those teachers who have the real, they're not going to chase after students. They're not going to be out there chasing after you. <laughs> you know, a real, a real teacher who is free of the eight worldly concerns, doesn't care about fame, doesn't care to have a lot of students, you know, and they're not going to chase after you. And you could meet them and they could just seem like something ordinary. You know, they don't have all the trappings. You know, sometimes people miss that. Um, but I think it comes from our own heartfelt wish. If, if it's not something you really want and you recognize that and you're willing to make those sacrifices, no, you can have that. I think it's possible. I know Westerners who are having those kinds of fortunate opportunities. 